eyes and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good evening. Have you ever noticed that in this world, people, they always want to belong to something, some kind of group or some kind of club. And it seems like people always want to be together and it gives them a sense of purpose, a sense of being. You know, we belong to a family. In school as a child, you belong to a club or a team and you belong to a class. As an adult, you may belong to a book club or a record club. You may belong to your school. Uh, school PTA or booster club. You might be a union and a union or a political party. You may be a member of a bank or some other club. But many times people just belonging gives them a sense of, of uh, fulfillment. You know, the other thing to think about is if you want to be a doctor, you have to go to college, you have to go to medical school, you have to pass the medical degree. In order to be a, a lawyer, you have to pass the bar exam. Even a truck driver has to have qualification. And he has to be certified, have a CDL license, an electrician, a plumber. All these people have requirements they must meet in order to be one of these things. We have obligations that we have to do in life in order to exist. To have as something as simple as a checking account in a bank, you have to agree to keep it in good order. You have to agree to pay the bank a certain fee for the checks, for letting you, for if you left your balance drop below a certain level, and you got to agree not to write checks for money that you don't have. Funny how we understand that we have to do things in an order in every day, and we have to do things a certain way in order to get along through everyday life. We understand how it works with our work, with our banks, clubs, landlords, and all the promises and things we must keep. But isn't it funny how we don't understand we have an obligation to our Lord and our Savior? In order to be called a Bible Christian, yes, the Bible gives us an example of a true Christian, or as we call them, the big C Christians, not the little C. The Bible is our rule book. The Bible is our instruction book. It shows us that in order to be a servant of Christ, we have obligations we must keep. We are given a book of instructions to follow in order to be a good, outstanding member of the club that Jesus built. See, many people want to call everything a church. So for tonight, let's think of it as a club of Jesus. The church Jesus built we know was built by Jesus and in order to be in that church, to be in that club, one has to do certain things. And we know from the gospel account of Matthew chapter 16 that Jesus talks about his church that he built. If we go to Matthew 16, starting with verse 13, we can see what Jesus first recorded about his church, his club. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But who say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, thou, <clears throat> and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the key of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There's a great lesson here, and we have to have the understanding that there is a fight between Jesus and the devil. And there's a fight between Jesus and this world. 
Because when we read in verse 13, Jesus was about to reveal further insight into his glorious identity as a Christ, and he gave him a taking the popular beliefs concerning him as the basis or the platform for what he was going to elevate the minds of the apostles and which he should elevate our minds today to a higher, nobler concept of Christ as the Son of God. Jesus asked, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And as a student of the Bible, as one who is studying out the Word of God, I find it so amazing that none of the popular beliefs at that time identified Christ as the Messiah. This shows how effective the Pharisees have been in their evil campaign against Jesus as the Christ. Even though at the time, at that time, think about it, the people could see him, they could hear him, they could talk to him, and they witnessed the miracles that he performed. Think about how great effect the devil, the evil one, has on people when he uses those minions and all the false preachers and teachers to keep people away from Jesus. You see, that's what he did then when Jesus walked this earth. He used his minions, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to keep people away from Jesus, just like he does today by using the false teachers and the false preachers. We can see in the Bible that there were many that first recognized Jesus as his Messiah. And let's take a look at some of those verses. We find it in the Gospel account as told to us by St. John. In John chapter 1, verse 40, it says, One of the two which heard Jesus spake and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. We find in John 1 also another example in verse 45 through 49, as it is written, Philip findeth Nathan, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathan said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathan, coming to him, and said to him, Behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom is no God. And they said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before thy fellow called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathan answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Look what was written in the Gospel message of John also. It's told by John in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can make, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost except God be with him. You see, here's a great example of people who saw the miracles of Jesus. And why did he come to him at night? Because he didn't want everybody to know that he accepted Jesus as a Christ. And this is what happens all too often throughout history. But there's a great example in John chapter 9. And to me this is a great example showing the power of the devil in his persuasion. <clears throat> in John 9, it starts out in verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was blind, born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in this pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed 
and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some say, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thy eyes open? He answered and said, A man is called Jesus, made clay, and anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Salaam, and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that a short time was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others says, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him? that he hath opened thy eyes. He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he see, now see? His parents answered him and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who had opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again, Called they the man that was blind, and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he, he to thee? How open he thy eyes? He answered him, I have told already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? They reveled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke unto Moses. As for the fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing? that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou art was altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. <laughs> Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Does thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into the world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sins remaineth. You know, here we see a man who was blind from birth. Everybody in the neighborhood knew he was blind from birth. 
The Pharisees had to know he was blind. Jesus restored his sight. And yet, the people did not want to recognize the fact that Jesus had given this man his sight. Again, the man never had any sight at all. Never had his sight. It wasn't that Jesus gave him back his sight, where someone could say, oh, he got hit in the head and you know, it came back miraculously. He was born blind, and Jesus made him so he could see. And yet, when we see this, and we read this, we can see all these people are afraid to recognize this. The Pharisees claim, this man is not a God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. The blind man's neighbor saw that he was blind. His parents saw the miracle that their son could see. But all were reluctant to speak up. The Pharisees, they feared, would be put them out of the synagogue. And they would become an outcast. This is the problem we still see this day. Many will hear the word preach. They will see it with their own eyes in the Bible. They'll see that Jesus is the Christ. And they know that we must follow the will of Jesus and the word of Jesus, not a man. But because of fear of their family shunning them, of their being put out of their friends, they won't come to Jesus. Satan, the evil one. In the manner of the parables that Jesus shared with us, had come and stolen the truth out of the hearts of these men that saw the miracles. Just as he comes and steals the miracles when a a person first hears the word of God and understands what they must do in order to get on that straight and narrow path, Satan will come and steal that joy out of their heart. Satan, the evil one, has sufficiently eroded the image of the Lord that no popular opinion prevailed to the effect that Jesus was a Christ. And it is so sad to report that Satan is still doing this today. You know, when you think about it, here's a man walking down the street. He's got his sight back. He tells him that Jesus gives him his sight. You'd think everybody would be so excited, and Satan was able to steal that away from him. Just like today, people hear the word of God. They find out that Jesus came to this earth to save us from death and sin. And yet, when people leave that message They go back to the world, and Satan is able to take that away from them. It is so sad. The erosion and the blurring of the truth that Christ is the Messiah has reached such proportion that Jesus even warned the apostles to beware of the living of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Today, we have to beware of the leaven of the false teachers and those who change the word of God. Jesus warns us all, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. When we look around this world today, there are many raving wolves. Many will compare Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Moses, David, and all the other great prophets to Jesus as immortals. Many of them are unanimous in giving Jesus is high statue along with the high prophets. But they fail in this. They do not give to Jesus the highest statue because Jesus is the head of all things. Jesus is the head of all things in heaven and in earth. Satan is perfectly willing for Jesus the Christ to be some great one as long as is you don't recognize him as the greatest one. Think about that. Jesus asked, but whom say ye that I am? Jesus in this question came to the heart of the heavenly mission. Everything repeat. Everything depend upon the answer to this question. Who is he? Doubt was a question asked by Paul That was a question that was asked by Paul on the road to Damascus when he said, Who art thou, Lord? We find in Acts 22.8. It is a question every man must ask today. "Who Who art thou, Lord? And they must answer that question correctly. You see, that's the whole key. 
Because you have to know who Jesus is, answer it correctly, before any such thing as salvation can be had. It is not enough to know the popular opinion that Jesus the Christ, or Jesus is the Christ, or Jesus is the Son of God, for the question depends on how you receive the answer and how you react to the answer and how you come to the Lord by your answer. And Simon Peter, ans and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is one of the greatest confessions. This is no meager acknowledgement that Jesus is the Messiah of the heavens, but also declares Jesus' unique, final relationship to God. The Son of God, here, is no more equivalent to the Messiah. This is shown by the deep emotion which Peter makes this confession, and how Jesus received the confession. And the fact that the confession is perfectly satisfied to Jesus, and this is forthwith made the dogmatic foundation of Christianity. Upon this rock I will build my church. Upon the fact that the Lord Jesus is the son of the living God is where the Lord Jesus has a right to build his church. Jesus told the twelve in verse 19 of Matthew 16, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He gave that to the apostles only. Man today has no right to change the word of God. Bind and loose refer to the power of deciding what was lawful and what was unlawful to be done in the church, or what was orthodox or what was unorthodox to believe. That power was and is exercised by all the apostles, and the New Testament is the instrument by which that binding and loosening are effective applied. Now many people seem not to understand that the New Testament is also called the Apostles' Doctrine, and it this is written rules. And if one wants to be called a servant of Christ, one must abide by the apostles' doctrine. You can call it a book of rules, a requirement in order to be a Christian in good standing. But this is a fact. What is bound in the apostles' doctrine is bound in heaven. And what was loose in the apostles' doctrine is loose in heaven. <clears throat> If you want to be a member of the Christian Club, the Big C Christian Club, then you must meet the requirements. The Christian Club, which is the Lord's Church, is an exclusive club. It is over 2,000 years old, and it has the same leader today that it had from the beginning. The same president, the same leader, the same set of rules. We like to call him the Lord of Lords. Because he is our king of kings. He is also known as our savior. Jesus the Christ. He is the only begotten son of the living God. The almighty father in heaven. To get into the Christian club you must accept Jesus Christ as your lord and your savior. As well as your lord and your master. Yes to be a Christian in good standing. One must be a servant of Christ. <clears throat> Just like most man-made club, one belongs to the club of Jesus, which is only club that is recognized by God. And you know what? It is, keeps you in line when you belong to this club. What helps keep you in line is the Holy Ghost, a gift from God, the comforter. <clears throat> one has to be come into this club and when one comes in this club, they come into this club by being baptized, by being immersed, and coming up a new creature in Christ. Unlike any man-made clubs, this club of Jesus has a purpose. And this club will last forever and ever, unlike any man-made club. And I don't mean that you're just a good member in this lifetime, but in the next lifetime, you're still a member of the same club. You will be a member in good standing in the next life. 
Membership in the club of Jesus has its privileges and its requirements to get into the club. One has to accept Jesus, the Christ, as your Lord and Savior, and one has to be buried with him by baptism. This is being born again, a person, a new creature in Christ. In the rule book, we find it written in the gospel account, it's told by St. John, known as John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus laid out the rules of the club. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it lists, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell Whence it come and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. And this was bound to all. This was bound to all who want to be the big C Christian, who want to be in the club that Jesus built, the church that Jesus built. We find that the apostles bound this on the opening day of the church. And we find this in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 goes through the history of the Jews. It goes through the history of the coming of the Christ. But on that opening day of the church, the apostles bound this to us here on earth as it is bound in heaven. And verse 36 will start and it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here is the answer. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The president of the club of Jesus tells to all who are here, in order to be a real Christian, in order to be a Christian of the Bible, in order to be one that God recognizes as being in the church that Jesus built, one has to be born again. Jesus points out, except the man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus tells to all who will hear, marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The kingdom of God is where our membership resides. Understand, to be a real Christian is to have everlasting life. Why is it people will understand what we have to do every day? Why do they understand how to keep a checking account? Why do they understand what they have to do in order to have a driver's license or keep a job? But they don't understand what it takes to please God. Because the cardinal things man looks at and the spiritual things we don't see. We need to understand today there's good advice throughout the Bible. The Bible is a written word of God. It is an instruction book. It is given to us as basic instructions before leaving earth. And it is here for us to read and to study. And one of the greatest advice that we have in the Bible we find in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, where we are told, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babbling, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. The inspired writer, Brother Paul, 
was the man who was known in Acts as Saul on his way to Damascus when he asked, Who art thou, Lord? That is what we need to know. Who art thou, Lord? And once we become a Christian, once we become a servant of Christ, we must be a servant of Christ. But it means we serve Christ. That means we study to show ourselves approved. And why do we study? So we know how to serve Christ. And why do we shun profane and vain babbling? Because what happens is, when you start listening to the false teachers and the false prophets and the false minions, you're truly listening to Satan. And we just saw in John 9 how these people saw the miracle that Jesus performed on this man. And yet Satan made it look like it never happened. All on the same day. How could he do that? See, so many people think, oh, I can outsmart Satan. Really? He's been around for a long time. And he knows us better than we know ourselves. Study. Pray. Study. Pray. That's what it's all about. Because the more we study, the more we pray, the closer we stay to Jesus, the harder it is for Satan to pull us back. Who died for you? See, it's real simple. Who paid the price for your soul? Who made the payments for your sins in full? Whose church is it? Jesus. 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 All the answers are Jesus. Amen? Amen? So if Jesus is the presence of the club, if Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who has the authority to change the rules? No one. I leave you with this. Two things to think about. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, verse 8 and 9 tells us, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So many people say, oh, this is outdated. This is outdated. This was for them back then. No. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, which is back here, today and forever until he comes back. Amen. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. But here is one that really, sometimes when I read this, it just makes me quinge. We find it from the Apostle Peter. He warns us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. And when you read this, think about what he's saying. And this is Peter, the one who denied the Christ, but he came back to the Christ. The one who saw the miracles... But yet he was afraid and denied to Christ. But yet he was strong enough to come back to Christ. And he says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it, is, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinners appear? Be on guard. Be on guard always for your soul and your salvation. Study. Pray. Don't lose your membership in the greatest club mankind has ever seen. For it is yours to lose. So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commands for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Tonight... If you are outside of Christ for any reason, what is holding you out? If you are one who is born again, who has the blood, the covering of Jesus, and you've fallen away, repent. Come back to Christ. Come back to Jesus. He is waiting for you. Repent. Come back. And if you're one who has never been born again, what is holding you out? Why would you not want to be in the church that Jesus built? The church that man builds is never going to make it when the world ends. When Jesus comes back and the world's on fire, his church is the only safe place to be. The rest will be praying for the mountains to fall on them. I want to be in the safe place to be. How about you? I will arrive.
eyes and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior.